In my experience teaching, I have encountered four special needs students that I was unprepared to teach. Starting with one while I was teaching in high school and the other three in college. Throughout my time in college, I began to scratch the surface of research in special needs and piano pedagogy. I found some articles, but not a ton was out there relating to that topic. I knew from my experience that I wanted to change that. My goal in this presentation is to provide practical introductory steps when teaching piano to the special needs student. I will be covering the educational aspects of specific special needs and some learning disabilities. Beyond that, I want to provide resources for further study on specific special needs, as well as broad topics in special education. My goal is that you would walk away from this presentation with enough knowledge and confidence to teach the special needs student in your piano studios. According to the US Department of Education and the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, the law on special needs states that a child with a disability means a child as having an intellectual disability, a hearing impairment, a speech or language impairment, a visual impairment, a serious emotional disturbance, an orthopedic impairment, autism, traumatic brain injury, another health impairment, a specific learning disability, deafness, blindness, or multiple disabilities, and who, by reason thereof, need special education and related services. Specific learning disability means a disorder in one or more areas of the basic psychological processes involved in understanding or in using language spoken or written that may manifest itself in the imperfect ability to listen, think, speak, read, write, spell, or to do mathematical calculations, including conditions such as perceptual disabilities, brain injury, minimal brain dysfunction, dyslexia, and developmental aphasia. We will begin with discussing a summary of learning disabilities. They're physical, including muscular dystrophy, multiple sclerosis, chronic asthma, and epilepsy. Developmental, such as Down syndrome, autism, dyslexia, and processing disorders. Behavioral and emotional, such as ADHD, bipolar disorder, or oppositional defiance disorder. And sensory impairment, which is being blind, visually impaired, deaf, or hearing impaired. According to understood.org, rightslaw.org, and teach.com, I found that ADHD, autism, dyslexia, processing deficits, hearing loss, and visual impairments were the most common among children and adults. To gain a more specific understanding of these special needs and piano pedagogy, I conducted a survey for piano teachers in the Oklahoma, Texas region. In doing this research, I was able to confirm that these music teachers were encountering the same disabilities I found that were the most common in the US. According to the survey, the learning disabilities most frequently encountered in piano studios were dyslexia, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, Processing Deficit Disorder, Autism, and Visually and Auditory Impaired. To share a quote from one of the teachers that I um, interviewed in the survey, he said, work with them just like you would work with any other individual student. Sometimes people are under the impression that students with special needs need a specific type of method to work with them effectively. I have simply found that that is not the case. I have found that working with these young people artistically, emotionally, and getting them to express themselves and tell stories at the piano. I have found that these students do a lot better than people think they are capable of doing. While conducting the survey, I found that most teachers stressed the involvement of parents in the learning process. 
I currently teach two special needs students and have found that in my own experiences, parent involvement is essential in the learning process for those students. With gathering information from the sources, the survey, and my own experiences, I have come up with these basic principles with parent involvement. Know that the parents are the expert with their child. Parents must be involved in the learning process. You must ask for a student's IEP. An IEP is more than just a written legal document. It is a plan for students who have been identified as having a special need. It's a map that lays out the program of special education instruction, supports, and services kids need to make progress and thrive in school. You can ask parents in conversations if this is something you can get from them. I would begin by asking in what ways and what tools do the parents have to help you while teaching their child. Also ask about their work and classes in school. This is where a parent would get an IEP. Have conversations before the first lesson as well as ongoing conversations. And know that the teacher must be open and honest with struggles and accomplishments. I teach an 11-year-old named William who has autism, ADHD, and dysgraphia. His amazing mom has agreed to share some advice with us dealing with parent involvement and her experiences. So whether it's his new band class, um, his teachers in school, his lesson teachers, we make it a point to introduce ourselves to all of them before learning ever starts. We make sure that they all read his IEP. We talk about his strengths and weaknesses, and they get to guide us in their expertise in just dealing with children. Um, we're always advocating for him, and it stands us in good stead as the teachers know that we're paying attention. So if something doesn't happen like we all think it should, then we have that conversation. Um, that bridge helps us just about every week in school and in lessons. It's a lot of work. Uh, we both have full-time jobs, but we hope that this foundation will reap rewards later. We also hope we're teaching him to advocate for himself because we have recognized that we can't always fight his battles. With special needs, you sometimes have to choose your hill to die on. And his music talent is one such hill and it has seen many battles, lots of injuries, a bunch of victory laps. And we know that learning music is worth it. So we keep going. I'd like to stress the importance of knowing basic piano pedagogy well. You need to already have plenty of tools in your toolbox to teach good, sound pedagogy. Whether that's through an education, experience, or whatever that may be, you need to be prepared as a piano teacher first before having a student with special needs. I want to share some advice from a dear friend and piano pedagogue, Sandra Meyer. She said, you need to be able to teach outside of the box. And if you're going to teach outside of the box, you better know the box pretty well. And in this case, the box being piano pedagogy. Starting with dyslexia and dysgraphia, which was the first on the list of special needs that were most encountered by piano teachers, dyslexia and dysgraphia are learning disorders that affect your ability to read, write, spell, and speak. Kids who have it are often smart and hardworking, but they have trouble connecting the letters they see to the sounds those letters make. About five to 10% of Americans have some symptoms of dyslexia and dysgraphia, such as slow reading, trouble spelling, and or mixing up words. I have highlighted some struggles that a student with dyslexia may have. They may have difficulty learning to read, write, spell, and do arithmetic. They may have difficulty following oral and written instructions. They may confuse sequences of letters and symbols, such as B and D, quiet and quiet, was and saw, 18 and 81. They may have delayed spoken language. They may confuse directions in space and time, right and left, up and down, north and south, yesterday and tomorrow. 
and they may have a high level of frustration. Some general strategies in education would be to clarify, simplify, and repeat written directions, present small amount of work, highlight essential information, and use more verbal directions than visual. Now being specific in your lesson time with the dyslexic student. Be clear when describing direction, so directions of notes, high to low, staff reading, etc. Be prepared by explaining using multiple sensory strategies, such as pointing, verbal instruction, and having the child move up and down the bench. This offers support in the spatial component of music reading, the discrimination between high and low, between rising and descending patterns. Know that musical timing may be a struggle. In an article by Katie Overy, results support suggestions that timing is a difficult area for dyslexic children and suggest that rhythm skills and rapid skills may need particular attention in any form of mu musical training with a dyslexic student. As a teacher, have multiple ways of teaching rhythm, such as large movements, clapping, tapping, stomping, etc. Be mindful of their reading level. Pick music that will help them retain what they already know, as well as move forward, but not too quickly. Teach pieces by rote. They will pick up and learn music faster by learning by rote than sometimes looking at music. And print music on colored paper or color code notation. An example of learning by rote, uh, this is a scherzo by Dmitry Kabalevsky. So I provided the music and then an example from one of my colleagues of what this piece sounds like. We will try that again. Here's an abstract for that piece that as a teacher you may use before teaching this piece. So it has instructions for what notes to play, what direction, what chords, it has the rhythm. And so as a teacher you may use this tool before, like I said, before teaching the student as well as sending it home with the student for them to use for themselves. Here are two examples of colored coded notation or notation on colored music. Um, so this is as simple as putting this colored paper in your copier, in your printer, and printing this off uh, for your students so that they will have an easier time reading music. Second on the list from the survey are processing disorders. There are different types of processing disorders. This includes auditory processing, visual, and sensory. It is a condition in which the brain has difficulty receiving and responding to information that comes through the senses. I have outlined some issues one may have with the processing disorder. Those include mishearing sounds and reading words, noisy environments may be overwhelming and prohibit learning, they may have trouble following verbal directions, and they may have trouble with spelling or phonics. Some strategies in general education to combat these issues are as followed. Use routines each day to develop focus. Reduce background noises. Speak clearly and directly to the students. Repeat directions several times. And gain bi-sensory attention. Now you can relate this to your own private teaching by creating a routine with short, clear instructions with each lesson. Be prepared to teach each concept orally, visually, and kinesthetically. Be consistent with terminology. So a quarter note always gets one beat. 
a beat is this. So avoid using the word beat in other aim examples. For example, now let's beat the top of the piano to the beat. Avoid using this type of language that may confuse a student with a processing disorder. Know that not all methods book works. You must have supplementary material and use technology as much as you can. Now an example of supplementary material would be a game and of cards called Note Speed. So this is a, a, they have different stacks of cards or levels. So starting with the primal, primer level, they have just the music alphabet. And then each level gets more and more difficult with note reading on the staff. So it starts with base F going up to trebles G. And then as the levels progress, each they get harder. So going up or down the staff in note reading, you can play games with them. You can use them as note cards, as flashcards. My students love this game and look forward to it during their lesson time. So this is a good way for them to get off the bench, to do something different, and also be learning at the same time. Using a floor staff or a floor piano would help. I, with my students, will have them step on, have them say, okay, will you step on C and have them step on it? Or I may say, okay, now let's step on, with both feet, step on C and D. What interval is this? And so there are several things you can do. Play games with them. You can have bean bags and say, okay, can you throw this on a F? Can you throw this on a C? Um, just, again, a different way of learning that gets them off the bench, gets them moving, um, and gets them to experience music from a different point of view. And then finally, Note Finder. This is a fun little tool that it allows you to move this note up and down the staff and drill note reading for the student. I use this, again, for drilling, or I also use this as a game. I will say, you know, how many can you get right in a minute? And they will do it, see, OK, can you get more this time? So again, making it a game and just something different and something for them to be learning music while not just staring at the page and having them being distracted. Here's an example of technology it's for Apple or Android products. So this is Rhythm Swing and Flash Note Derby. So I have an example from Rhythm Swing. This is what that game looks like and what it does for you. So this app has a teaching mode, a testing mode um, that, that tests a student's ability to know their rhythms, to teach them their rhythms. And again, it's just a fun way um, to get them to learn um, using something different than just the page. Here's Flash Note Derby. So this tests their note reading ability. Again, it's just a fun game. I use this with my students all the time, and they are always so excited to play this game. And, and they're learning at the same time, which is great. So in this example, I will click the right notes as I see. I, you'll see that I will get one wrong. And when I get one wrong, you'll see what happens after the game is over. So as you can see, I got nine out of 10 correct. And again, after the game, it allows you to look at the mistake you made and review that and take time to actually figure out what note it is. 
Again, these are just great ways for your students to learn um, and have fun while doing it. Next on the list is Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. ADHD is a chronic condition that affects millions of children. This often continues into adulthood. ADHD includes a combination of persistent problems such as difficulty sustaining attention, hyperactivity, and impulsive behavior. This also includes a short attention span and being in easily distracted, being unable to sit still, constant fidgeting, excessive physical movement, unable to organize and stick to tasks that are tedious or time consuming, unable to listen to or carry out instructions, and they may experience excessive talking. Some general education strategies would be to simplify instructions, choices, and scheduling, divide work into smaller units, lower the noise level, perform ongoing student evaluation, and ask probing questions. Now when applying these to your own teaching, think about these things. Make sure there are no distractions in the studio. For example, clocks, phones, scented aromas, these things may distract a student with ADHD. Create a structure of the lesson and make sure it is clear to the student. For example, we will spend five minutes warming up, five minutes playing, five minutes with theory, etc. Set behavioral boundaries, both with the parents and with the student to know what is not acceptable in a lesson time. Maintain a quick pace and positive attitude. Create cues to help with the flow of the lesson and stay on task. And move off the bench to do activities. An example of cues that could help in a lesson, you can have pieces of paper, for example, red. You can hold up red to mean, you know, sit down, put their hands on the keys. Blue could mean be off the bench and ready for a game. Green can mean no talking. And yellow could mean time to pack up and go home. An example of getting off them off the bench and doing activities, this is one of my colleagues and her student. I think this was just a brilliant way for her to get her student off the bench, moving, experiencing music, um, all while, again, like I said, getting off the bench and getting some physical energy out. Let's start out doing something fun today. So I'd like you to stand up, scoot your bench back and stand up. And I'm gonna play something for you. And tell me, tell me a word or you can show me a dance move, something that you think that matches this, this music. I can't help but smile whenever I see this video because I think it's, it's such a wonderful example and the student, of course, is so graceful and having fun and dancing and just having a great time, like I said, while still enjoying music and making music. Now on to the fourth special needs. Autism or autism spectrum disorder refers to a broad range of conditions characterized by challenges with social skills, repetitive behaviors, speech, and nonverbal communication. According to the Center for Disease Control, autism affects an estimated one in 54 children in the United States today. The following list is providing a more in-depth description of this disorder. They may have difficulty with social interaction. They may have unusual interest in objects. They may have difficulty with changes in a routine. 
They may have ability in one area and a lot of difficulty in another. They may have strong reactions to one or more of their five senses. They may do the same thing repeatedly or talk constantly. And they may have intense and prolonged emotional reactions. Some general education strategies would be to treat them like every other student, create a classroom routine, focus on students' strengths, use preparatory commands and commands of execu execution to cue transitions, give fewer choices and keep it simple, watch for sensory issues, uh, visual and auditory, some applicable strategies in your teaching could be the following ways. Make sure your studio is clear of small objects. The student may be interested in playing with them or touching them, distracting them from your time teaching them. Say what you mean and mean what you say. So do not be sarcastic with an autistic student. They don't and will not often accept sarcasm well. Be aware of social cues. So be especially aware of the student's emotions and behavior. If a student appears scared, sad, afraid, frustrated, be especially aware and careful with your responses. Give detailed instructions for every concept. Create a routine. And use colors for coordination when necessary. An example of a routine, um, in an article done by Scott Price, uh, he explains his lesson time, what he says to a student during his lesson time. So this is an ex example of just a broad, what he would do throughout the whole lesson. So today, we're going to work on the right hand and left hand. Then we are going to work on finger numbers. Then we are going to work on white key names. Then we are going to work on black key names. Then we're going to do your pieces. Um, and so on and so forth, again, being very, very clear with the routine and what they would be doing throughout the lesson. And then this is an example with while he was teaching a specific piece to an autistic student. So he said, this is your right hand. This is your finger. This is your finger number two. This is the piano. This is the piano key. This is the black piano key. So again, being very, very clear in his instructions. Next is an example of using colors for coordination. I have a student, a 26-year-old student named Tommy who has autism. Uh, I began teaching him last August, and since the beginning, he has been fully capable of playing the piano with his right hand and playing the right notes and rhythms, and then playing with his left hand and also you know, doing the same thing. But sometimes when putting them together, they wouldn't always uh, be right on the beat together or sometimes they would they just come at different times and so about a month ago he came to me with Furry Lease in which he played and as you can see I've highlighted the first beat of every measure so he was having trouble with his hands coming together and so before I had him do this they it, it wasn't it just wasn't happening for him and then I'm going to show you an example of after right after he did this it improved so much and so this is an example of color coordination. Can you play and really focus on your hands coming together? Yeah. Okay, let's start at the beginning. to see before what he played like before this but I can assure you that the progress was amazing and as you can see the, the, the product of what color coordination can do for a student. 
According to hearingloss.org, around 48 million Americans have some degree of hearing loss. I found this number to be quite astounding. I think that it's so important as educators to be able to identify when this affects a student. Some general things to be aware of would be they may have difficulties following verbal directions. They may have difficulty with oral expression. They may have difficulties with social, emotional, or interpersonal skills. They may have a degree of language delay. And they may have articulation difficulty. In general, you should be aware of these strategies while teaching. Know about hearing aid technology ranges and frequencies. Know that noisy environments must be kept to a minimum. Shut classroom doors, windows to help eliminate noises. Know that visual pro you to use visual approaches whenever possible. Use the closed captioning feature if you're going to use videos. Enunciate words clearly using lip movement to assist the child to lip read. And keep proximity to the student. Now some tips with piano pedagogy, some piano pedagogy applications would be to have faith in your students to succeed. Limit in the music, they know that there will be limits in the music making process, such as dynamics, timbre, accurate rhythms. Be prepared to have clear visuals for every concept. Use electric keyboards to be able to use headphones to turn the volumes up and down and be able to conduct using visual cues to show rhythms and beats by hand motions. I've provided a few examples of electric keyboards. Um, so before looking this up, I thought that keyboards were also always out of my range. And so compared to the wide variety and the wide span of that prices may go, these are relatively, re relatively cheap and affordable for your studios and they can be delivered straight to your home. An example of conducting, so I have a colleague here who is not, um, does not have any hearing loss, but I asked her to just play to the beat by watching my hands and watching my conducting. The last special needs I will address is the visually impaired. Visually impaired people may suffer from these symptoms. Severe or sudden eye pain, recurrent pain in or around the eye, hazy, blurred, or double vision, seeing flashes, rainbows, or halos around lights, and they may be seeing floating spider webs. In general, you should be aware of these strategies when teaching. Know that visual aids, know about visual aids and resources such as glasses, magnifiers, big print books. Have suitable lighting behind or to the side of the student. The student, the light should never be in the student's face. This could prevent them even more from seeing what they need to. Give clear instructions. Increase oral activities. And consider the use of enlarged print or magnified worksheets. Some piano pedagogy applications would be to give a tour of the studio, so show the student around, so that way they know where your desk is, where tables are, uh, where anything is that they may be aware of. 
Be aware of tone and clarity when speaking. Ask before touching a student for physical demonstrations. Um, ask for permission from the parent and the students before touching them because you will be using a lot of physical demonstrations while teaching them. Use the Library of Congress to access Braille music. So if your student is completely blind and they do know how to read Braille, know that this is available to you. Do keyboard awareness exercises. And print large symbols on sheets of paper, for example, sharps, flats, notes, etc. An example of keyboard awareness exercises, again, I've asked my co uh, colleague who's not visually impaired, but I asked her to close her eyes and to find groups of two black keys and then find groups of C, D, E. And then here's an example of her finding CDE. And then an example of using large print. So this is an example from the Faber series, the primer level. Uh, you can see a piece with uh, practice steps with instructions um, and with the notes. And so what I've done is blown up just the notation part. So this is an example of one full piece of paper, and this would be equivalent to two pieces of paper. And so you can see everything is just blown up, much easier for the student to see and, and much easier for them to read. I would like to share a quote from a piano pedagogue. She said, have a completely, completely open mind, don't have certain expectations, and let the student, the parents, and yourself lead the progress. Don't try and follow one that fits a certain approach. Have an open mind, compassion, be understanding, and be resourceful. You have to be resourceful, have grit, and you must persevere. To conclude, I would like to thank you all for listening to my presentation. I believe that every living person deserves the absolute best teaching instruction and music experience we have to offer them. We have the access to the tools and resources to make that happen. We just have to do it. Now that I have the knowledge that I do about teaching the special needs student, I have the opportunity to teach students like William and Tommy. They are both absolutely brilliant and to see them succeed makes it all worth it. I hope that if you encounter a special needs student, that the information that I've shared with you today would give you a starting point. I assure you that the benefits far outweigh the challenges as we work together to provide music for all. <laughs>